and we are live. Hi, everyone. My name is Tamara Woods. Welcome to my channel. This is Writer's Workshop, a monthly writing book club where we talk about books that are relating to the publishing industry, whether it's indie or traditional. We cover it all here. And <laughs> Yes, that was excellent punctuation. <laughs> that was my notification for the workshop. <gasps> it went out? Yeah. Oh, exciting. <laughs> I'm excited to know that it went out. Cool. All right. So today we are going to be <coughs> discussing this book. Let me show Oh, I can share a screen and every team. Do, 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 do. Let me share this book right here. Look at this book. I'm getting there. It's happening much slower than expected <laughs> at least i don't have to share audio this one become a successful indie author by craig martell so how about my lovely co-hosts y'all can introduce yourselves even though one's an avatar but you get the point <laughs> uh, let's start with cj Hello, I'm CJ. I am a novelist and I don't know what else you're supposed to say. <laughs> that's all I've got. Yeah, that's fine. Kara? And a piano instructor. That's what I've got. Um, my name is Kara Brown. I am an urban fantasy author and the operations director over at Otherworld Inc. Um, I actually really enjoy reading books like this because it always like helps me to know what resources are out there for other people. So I was actually really excited to read this book. Um, so yeah, that's me. And Amber? Hi guys, I'm Amber Craft. I'm a paranormal romance author. And yeah, that's me. And then in the comments, we have JD Robinson and SD Hagas, and they are both a part of this group as well. And I think that we have some people probably coming in from the Writers Workshop Goodreads group. There's a link in the description for that if you'd like to join. I think that would be amazing. So this book, it, you know, it's discussing how to be successful. But mm -hmm. my first question to you guys is how do you define success? I think that's, I, I think before you could figure out how you're going to be successful, you have to know what success means to you. So what does success mean to you? For me right now, it would mean finding an eyeglass wipe. So everything isn't so swatchy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I guess for me, like being successful is at least like staying a little bit above the line, like having enough return to basically pay for the investment that I put in there is what I would deem as success right now. And probably when I reach that bar, I'm just going to make it up a little bit higher just because I don't want to be like, I don't want to sit there and be like, well, this is okay when I could continue to push myself further. We in this chat, we are all at different stages in our publishing journey. Uh, for me, at this point, I too am working on having the return and investment to um, somehow equal at least or be more than what I'm putting in. But I haven't gotten to a point where I am like, like, um, charging myself an hourly wage or anything like that mm -hmm. like i'm not there yet and i haven't created a, a company company yet um amber you have one book out and cj is still working toward having a book out so what mm -hmm. do you guys call success for yourselves at this point i think for me it's a little bit of the same thing just being into the black um Considering the fact that I was moving so I didn't get to market, like, I think I'll probably have that e expectation for book two. Um, but, yeah, for now, it's just really that and then growing from there. And, and like you said, once you reach that goal, then you just make number two's goal number one. Mm, CJ? I would say for me at this point, it's just to get a book published. Um, I have some goals. I actually am um, in the process, like this month, I've reached a point in my, um, in my day job where I can support myself in like with that day job 
So I only am work, I'm only working one day job, but it's not a 40 hour, 40 hour a week job. Um, it's much less time commitment. So the amount of time I have to write and work through writing, that was a big goal for me. So that my next goal is to get something published, to finish something and publish um, beyond like, I have a free serial, but an actual novel to get out there. And right now that's, that's my next. That's your goal. And in the book, Craig Martelli, he was discussing his success. And of course he was talking about how success means something different to everyone. And he was saying that, you know, you create one goal and then once you succeed at that, like you've succeeded at having enough from your day job to fund this and it has enough time left over so that you can actually dedicate to writing. And now your next success goal is to complete something and publish it. I think that's fan freaking tastic. So just in general, uh, did y'all find this book helpful? Very. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Like this is the book that when I first started, I would have liked to have had. Um, I know a lot of the information that's in this book can be found in other places, but the key phrase in there is other places. Like you have to go and find it and learn it and then you have to accumulate it where he's actually just taken everything that we, you know, spent time learning firsthand and just put it in one book. And he was really frank about it too. Like there's no like, you know, it's like you can do it because you're amazing. He, it's more like this is how it's done and it's not easy, but if you stick with it, you'll get results. And I really appreciated that tone of voice and the way that he presented the information. You can yeah. definitely, if you are part of the 20 books to 50K group, you can definitely feel that in this book because that mm -hmm. group is definitely about the business aspect of being an indie and a published author. And even though he did address things like, and, and in some ways it, he even had like an artistic way of putting things, but it was still about the business, the bottom line mm -hmm. and doing the work and getting it done. And I really appreciated that. Oh, JD says, um, success for me is being able to support my family with my books. And Sky says, uh, for me, it would be awesome just to be able to pay even a small bill with funds made from royalties. My phone bill is less than 40 a month. It would be amazing to pay it using royalties. I feel that. And Aphrodite and anyone else, if you want to pick up the book, I have a link in the description just to let you know so you could pick it up um if you have kindle unlimited it's free and i think the price otherwise is 2.99 yes it's 2.99 right yeah. now it's on sale so and i don't know i feel like it's worth the three bucks oh absolutely uh, JD like the uh, rants in the back. I think that he oh, like those that. rants out of the 20 books group. I think those are because sometimes he'll have like big rant posts. They will post in the top and you everyone will like kind of co-sign it or whatever. <laughs> those were excellent. Um, so one thing that he talked about was um, trolls. Like say for instance someone trolling in your reviews or and since we are author tubers maybe trolls in the comment section mm -hmm. so he gave some advice for how he handles trolls how do you guys handle trolls or how would you handle trolls with your uh let's say if someone was spamming your amazon and goodreads reviews or your website your blog spamming it with negative rude and evil comments how do you handle trolls well, so like for sites like Goodreads and Amazon, they do have a harassment policy. So if it actually falls within that guidelines, I would report them on YouTube. Um, I got this block feature, so I usually handle it that way. Um, if somebody pops up into like my comments on my live videos, I look and see how many of my friends are there. I throw them all wrenches and say, have fun. And then that problem usually resolves itself in like five minutes. <laughs> have you experienced be trolls on your blog, CJ? No, um, I don't think there's enough traction there to really, I don't have a wide enough audience to attract anything that's terribly negative. So um, I'm sure that there will probably be some at some point. Um, fortunately, I've been, I've had the, <laughs> the privilege, I guess, to watch 
other people handle them. I've seen Kira handle trolls. I've seen you handle trolls. Sarah handles them. And you all handle them a little bit differently, but there is a theme of ignore until it becomes an issue and then address within the limits, within the, the boundaries of whatever platform you're using. Amber? Yeah, I haven't had any. I've been lucky so far, both on AuthorTube, YouTube, and anywhere my books are. I haven't had any, at least that I'm aware of. So I, I think, like, like CJ said, you just kind of, you have to ignore a troll and hope they go away. And then if they're a more persistent troll, then deal with it when it becomes too much. The one thing that I think was important that he noted was when you receive negative reviews, leave them alone. Yeah. Don't address it. Don't discuss it. It's, it looks bad on you as an author to address all of the negative reviews. Mm -hmm. Readers are allowed to feel how they're going to feel about your book. And I know you put a lot of time and effort into it. I know you love it. I know this was like blood, sweat, and tears. But in once you put it out into the world, you your ownership lessens and the readers begins, you know? So and they're allowed to own how they feel and they're allowed to tell the world, even if it sucks, even if they're cruel. Sometimes you just have to not read it. Yeah. Honestly. And you gotta, and you have to talk to your friends if they're protective too, because like uh, I got a one star review on my book within like three days, and the person didn't read it. And it's really evident if you read the comment that they hadn't read it. They just got like shocked by it, and then they they voted it whatever. And I remember because a bunch of my friends were like, "I want to go talk to this person. I want to school this person. I have things to say." And I was like, "Leave it. Don't talk to them. Don't build up the bonfire." don't do it. Um, and especially like one of my friends who is a, is an author tuber. And I said, you definitely can't do it because what's going to happen is if a nosy, a nosy person will come and see that you and I are friends and they're going to see that you do that and that's not professional. So don't do it. So, yeah. Even to expand on that a bit, Carol and I do author tube news and it's a podcast where we talk about publishing stuff. And there was an author in December Yes. who was who went on a absolute rampage going off on all these readers who had given her a negative review and here's the thing now people recognize her yeah but they recognize her as the author who attacks readers yeah she who, who's going to want to review you she who's came back to recommend you yeah she, and then she, she didn't know my name she thought i was sarah like I'm yeah, big friends with you and Sarah's channel, and I'm like, you know, I really like Sarah. I just didn't think that we looked that much alike. I mean, she sent me like a seven thousand word it was, essay. It was massive. Of course, we didn't see it for like a month. <laughs> yeah, because you know, Facebook doesn't always let you know when you get a message, and I was just astonished because one, she said everything that essentially we said, but I guess it made her feel better to say it in her words, and two. I didn't understand the point of reaching out to us. It didn't really make sense other than to, for her to let us know that she was now not a fan, but like, otherwise it was, it, what's your point? So, you know, she does this with her fellow writers, with her fellow authors. She does it with readers and that develops a reputation. Well, I think that um, he talks about your brand yeah. early yeah. on in the book. And that is an essential, I think that's an essential part of your brand is how do you handle criticism? Mm -hmm. How do you handle constructive criticism? How do you handle trolls? How do you handle that kind of engagement? Because positive engagement is incredibly easy to handle. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> oh, thank you. You're just so lovely. I just love you all. But negative engagement is much more difficult to handle because and with that professional branding that you have, you need that, you need the ability to step back and say, you know what, I'm not gonna touch that, or um, you know what, I'm gonna handle that in this sphere privately out of the limelight, not, yeah. we're not posting that wherever, so. 
Yeah, and then dive in a little bit more because he does touch on professionalism a good bit in that chapter where he talks not only about, you know, how to respond to stuff like that, but he also talks to you about the importance of the image that you represent to your peers as well. Um, and he, I like the way he worded it. It was like, if you come off as an asshole, that's all people are going to see you as and people don't like to work with assholes. Um, and I was just like, oh, well done. I love, I love that. Yes. Um, so it's just like, it's always just remembering to treat the people that you work with, even if you don't work with them in an office environment, if you're in the same industry, you should still be courteous and respectful of them, even if you don't agree with something that they may say. It's not really your place to go and police people. So let's see what people are saying in the comments. Dahlia says, no person reads the same book. Each person interprets your writing in a different way and mm -hmm. will react differently. True. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree. And Aphrodite said, yes, the tar and feather will come out with your friends. I had to beg folks not to go after this person. <laughs> it's, and you know, your friends love you and they care mm -hmm. about your feelings. And they care about your work. And I absolutely understand. I totally get it. But it just, it just doesn't help. Mm -mm. Wendy says you've got to accept that not everyone is going to like what you like what your work and they're going to state their opinions yeah if they're just not gonna they're not everyone's gonna like it and that's fine yeah. there's definitely a fine line between disagreeing with someone who's just straight at harassing them mm -hmm. that's true too yeah and you need to like oh go ahead Oh, I was going to say he had an example about where he was at a panel and somebody said that his book sucked because of the book size. Mm -hmm. And then he actually went and changed the book size and the person was like, good, you changed it, but didn't buy it. So he literally changed yeah. by the feedback of somebody else. And that person didn't, re you know, he didn't do anything. So there are just people who want to say things because they're just not happy. I, what's the song? I'm only happy when it rains. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. By garbage. We're old. Yeah. yeah. So I'm old. I love happy that. When it I'm only happy when it's gone. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, while I was reading it, one of the things I started thinking about was um, hustle culture, because a lot of this is so very much work related. Mm -hmm. um, here's one quote: "I write every day and." a fair number of words. I rarely delete too many words. I might move them into a different story, but damn it, I type these words first um, and I'm going to, and I'm going to use them. And I was thinking about that and I was thinking about how much he was talking about like writing from two to 3,500 words a day. And he's done that for like 800 and some days in a row he'd said like so he's working every single day and he's not taking a day off what do y'all think about that i i think that um his drive is different because not everybody has that drive like i know that i occasionally need oh. to stop and do things that recharge me but he also states in the writing that writing is what makes him happy so he's doing the thing that recharges him at the same time i probably treating it like the business is where the work comes in and then the writing is his recharge i can't do that that's not how my brain operates unfortunately yeah i i have to agree that i can't hold on to that level of uh, productivity <laughs> is it a stream if caro brown's dogs do not talk no no it's not, no. It's not. <laughs> they have to have their two cents as well amber what do you think about hustle culture that's really hard to say <laughs> so if i say that five times fast um I think I, I first I respect his dedication to do it every day because that means every holiday, every important thing with his family. But if that's what recharges him, then then that's fine. Um, me, I kind of have to take a step away. But I think it's important to know when a hustle is is something good and when it can become into, I guess, something negative towards you know harming your health and, and realizing that the hustle is, is not something that has to be done every day or if it does. Yeah, I think that's an important, Go ahead. sorry, I was gonna say, I think that's a, an important point. Um, I have a friend who she sleeps about four or five hours a night 
on a good night. Um, she works from the minute she gets up until the minute her head hits the pillow. And she is incredibly high energy. She works a part-time job that she throws like probably close to full-time hours in. Plus she has a second volunteer job that she probably throws somewhere between 30 and 40 hours in. She has a family. She does all of these things. And she works with me in a volunteer position. And we have to have these conversations about when, when I see you in the morning, you can't say hi and then ask me seven questions in a row because I need a moment. Right. And I think recognizing that both in yourself and in other people, like mm -hmm. what your needs are versus what their needs are is important and not comparing yourself to other, other people's, um, I don't want to say abilities, but other people's work style or, or function style. There are people who are incredibly high energy who do thousands and thousands of things who can juggle 17 million balls and never drop one. This woman doesn't keep a calendar. It's all in her head. Like she's wow. brilliant. She's absolutely brilliant. Can she share some of that? <laughs> I, I ask her often. She oh. doesn't know how, like there, there, there's no, there doesn't seem to be a, a pass there. Um, but <laughs> I mean, here's the thing. It doesn't come without detriments. Like, that kind of personality does not come without detriments. And so, but on the same side, like I'm, I'm with Caro. I, I can't work every day, 12 hours a day doing the same thing. Like I can't do that. I'm a piano teacher. And so my day job is less, like it's considerably less stressful than when I was working as an assistant in a high stress organization but it still requires people time. And as an introvert, after I have people time, I need some alone time. And that may include reading or doing some things that could fall within the category of writing work, but the focus of must write, must edit, must do all of this work stuff doesn't necessarily, it's not something I can do 24 seven. I hear See, that. And that changes as well, because, I mean, for the past three years, that was, well, except with the brilliance, because I'm not brilliant, but that that was me. Like, I, I was high energy, and then life started to change. I got older, jobs changed, and now I actually sleep more than four hours a night. So, you realizing that as time goes on, that, you know, people will change what their what their functionality is in life, too. So there was two comments I wanted to look at. Um, Aphrodite said, I write every day and rarely take a day off. I, I will get severely depressed if I go without writing for a length of time, which I think that's important to recognize what you need as a person. And if writing every day is part of what keeps you going, what makes you happy, then, I mean, it makes sense. But if writing every day doesn't work for you, then you shouldn't. And that was something that when Craig Mart in this book, when Craig Martell was talking about like, you know, writers should write every day. I was like, eh, that's one of his like his statements that I don't really go for. So um, JD says he's also at a very different point in his life than some of us. I'm happy if I get a chance to write any day of the week, let alone every day. And that is true. He said that he, like he has done all of his like work life i think he said he had worked for like 21 years mm -hmm. so he had kind of a nest aid to fall back on so that he could retire <laughs> and then do the writing thing so he wasn't necessarily I, i'm not even sure how old he was he's because he said that he went and got his um his law degree when he was 41 or 42. So I'm not sure how old he is, but he's definitely at a different point in life than like I am. And I'm going to assume that the ladies who are joining me on this panel are as well. So that's something to consider. He did talk about, hang on, I got to look it up. In, um, uh, I think it was chapter three. 
It was chapter two. It was page 33. Um, it's in his 50s, J.D. said. Thank you. Okay. Um, he did say, he did talk about um, setting reachable goals. Mm -hmm. um, and while he talked about setting high goals, they do need to be reachable for you. Um, and one of the things he talked about was, um, and I don't know, maybe I, did, I, took, I took liberties in the interpretation, but what I read was the things that you track need to line up with your goals. Right. So if you want to, if writing every day is a goal that you want to achieve, like that's part of your, your business goals, um, then you have to set yourself up to reach those goals. And you have to recognize, for example, I could write every day, but there would have to be some other things that I choose not to do mm -hmm. because I, I want to do that. And that energy and that, um, that creative um, output has to be purchased somewhere. Like that, mm -hmm. I have other creative endeavors. I, ha I would have to not do one of those in order to do that every day. So there's always that give and take, I think. Yeah, the opportunity cost to do something versus the other thing that you could be doing is is really important, especially if we're looking at working versus recharging. I mean, I, he didn't really dive too much into the mental. Oh, no, he did dive a little bit into the mental health. It was just kind of like a moment. Yeah. But, you know, making sure that you're just mentally taking care of yourself and knowing what works for you and what doesn't work for you is really is, is really important. So another, so um, in case you guys haven't checked out the book or haven't had a time to look it up, it really does give you a lot, a, a pretty good breakdown of what you need to do from almost inception of idea to marketing the book. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it really is a great place to start. And even if you have been at it for a while, you might pick up some information. So one thing that he was talking about in terms of marketing was the importance of a cover yeah and yeah and he was discussing um like things like you know getting a book cover designer but one thing that i think is always interesting is knowing what kind of covers are of interest to the genre that you're writing in yeah. so i wanted to ask you all about your genres and what are the like cover type of dealios that happen with your within your genre and let's see maybe we can do a thing where i show off your covers uh -huh, you can't show mine i mean <laughs> <laughs> well covers are covers can be complex at the same time so like um like romance cover, like when you look at a book, you should be able to be look at a book and say, oh, that's a romance or that's an urban fantasy or that's a thriller or that's a mystery. You know, it should be a dead giveaway. And oh, yeah. book. Um, and so some of the things that will give it away are going to be um, the colors on the cover, the font. And we'll use my book as an example. Um, in urban fantasy, often what you will see is a badass hero or heroine. Uh, and you're also going to see that exact same font that you see right there. Um, now, a lot of the other one, the, one of the really big important things when it does come to the cover is to make sure that you can see it as a thumbnail. Um, yeah. we, one of the artists that we had, um, he had never done book covers before. And so, like, I had explained to him how to do a book cover, but he was already, like, doing things. And so his learning experience was that it spent so much time on all these little details that when I shrink it down, I won't see them so they don't matter. And that's a really a big important thing to keep in mind, like all that. All right, so I'm gonna grab Amber's real quick. And then- well, Yeah, and like, <coughs> I'm, I'm actually working on getting the cover for book two right now. And that was the thing was I had to choose between what I wanted on this book to show for the series to tie into the series and what I wanted to tie into the actual book. And for book one, it was simple because it was the introduction to the universe and, and the girl and everything. Um, 
But when it comes to the rest of the series, you know, you have to decide because they're standalones, do you tie into the series or do you just show what's in the book? And I was kind of the same thing as Kara. When you try to put too much in to show the series aspect of it, the thumbnail just, it just looks like a blob. So I had to decide what elements I wanted to try to keep and what to take away. And we took one element away at a time to see what would look good. And... At, in the end, I ended up just using an entirely different book-related only cover because there was no way I could do it to make it right. Whereas with cover one, I knew exactly what I wanted. Yeah, and then one more thing that I want to point out is that your cover is a marketable item, right? right. You take your illustration and then you put a book blurb on the back. This is actually something that he said that he did when he went to cons where he would have the yep. cover and then the blurb. And then if people couldn't stay to talk to him, he would just hand it to them. So they would at least know what the book looked like and they would know roughly what it was about. So it's you always want to do things like whenever you have something, figure out how can I use this to market it and how can I use it to help increase my profits? So those are two really big, important questions that he also mentions in the book as well. Um, I have my cover this one is on um bookmarks she, they like your bookmark well thank you guys <laughs> so um yes i write cozy mysteries and with cozy mysteries there's a couple elements that um are important that are happening here in this cover one is the title murder to spare um cozy's the trend right now is for them to have some type of pun so I had to have the pun action happening. Another thing is the, a lot of times you'll either have realistic covers or you'll have covers that have a cartoon vector on the front. So that's why I have uh, Issa there and she's so freaking cool. And I wish my hair was like hers. So, so those were a couple elements that when I was discussing creating this cover with my uh, cover designer, Mariah Sinclair, those were two things that we definitely wanted to make sure were happening. And, and one things that like, which was interesting talking with her. So we see that the, we have this background here. I had the option of either going with this background and just kind of changing it a little for each book in the series or having completely different backgrounds. And there was, you know, pros and cons to doing either one. So like with having the different elements, it would be interesting, but having kind of the same elements and carrying them throughout, then it unifies the series. And like when someone sees that book, they know, oh, this is part of that series. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we see that a lot with um, Cozy Mysteries and books in general. But anyway, so little shameless self promo and we talk about covers i mean uh, oh thank you cv so and you guys are very sweet also um earlier they said that the puppies were might ha be giving us uh writing advice but we just can't understand them so uh you need to work on a translator okay I'm, I'm on it. i'll get on that yeah and then one i guess one other thing i forgot to mention is that all your covers if you're doing a series need to have a similar theme um, so I'm going to use Alona Andrews as a really good idea or a really good example about what I'm talking about, because when they write their books and then they write their series, their covers are going to have a similar format. And then they also have a similar title theme. So like for like, what, which one is this? Uh, I swear I love you. This is not the time for their hidden legacy books. Their hidden legacy books always have the main couple on the cover, right? And then on top of that, their title always has something like fire or burning related. So that's how you can identify that series. Their other series, which is the Innkeeper Chronicles, usually has the main girl on the front, has something to do with sweeping or a broom or whatever. Like that, then that's when you see, and that's really good because the moment that you see the cover or you hear the title, you're like, oh, that's part of that series or that involves those characters. Like it's, it's, like covers are complicated and titles are complicated. It's all complicated. <laughs> well, and it goes like even bigger, like, uh, like Janine was saying fonts, uh, you know, you don't want 20 million different fonts if it's one series. Um, you know, he talks about that, you know, with, with each type of his books, he had different, like his free trader series had one type of font his other series had another type of font. The, the continuate, yeah, 
that word, just being continuous throughout one series, be it the cover or the font or the aspects of the genre, can make or break a cover because nobody's going to understand what it is unless you spell, spell it out what series it goes to. So right now I have two series. Um, the one that I just showed you is from the Mystic Eye. And so with each of those titles, there's murder is a or some type of um, linking verb and then a noun. So I'm not going to tell you the other the other titles. They haven't been announced yet, but they all have that same basic um, breakdown. And um, with the Beachbound Cozy series, the first book is entitled Wiped Out, which is also a pun because it this is a surfer who dies. Uh, <laughs> that's the person gets murdered. But so each one from there on will have two words that have a punch to it wiped out it's very hard-hitting kind of title um but okay so sky says series branding is important to you there needs to be a common thing theme between each of the books which i think that we kind of covered and she said paranormal romance is full of covers with the couple and magic lily lights or some kind of paranormal aspect mm -hmm. and that's what she writes um aphrodite says my series covers are one big poster that's cut into three covers so if they line up next to each other they make a poster well hold on on one of her videos she actually has the poster behind her and i'm curious to see what the entire poster is going to look like because she literally only has enough that shows book one i'm like oh i want to see the whole thing let's see here so just so you guys can so for those of you who haven't seen the cover, I'd love being able to show these things, you guys. I really do. It's very convenient. So that is shattered. And so, so yeah. So it gives you an idea of what she's talking about. I love doing that. All right. Let's see. What else do we have here? I think it ties in well to knowing your goals ahead of time. Getting all three covers at once for the series was so much easier than tying my last series together visually. Yeah, I absolutely understand that. I think that, I think I absolutely agree with you. I Writing a series is so different from writing a standalone. And, you know, we are kind of encouraged to write series these days because there's, you know, binge reading exists and it's very much a thing. That's why Kindle Unlimited is so popular amongst readers because you can get 10 books at a time or you can read them all and binge the entire series in over a weekend or whatever. And it feels great. Yep. Not saying I ever do that, but you know, sometimes I do. No shame. <laughs> no shame. No shame in it. Um, so, you know, if you go into knowing that you're going to do a series or at least the first three or four books and you have an idea of what you're going to be kind of what you're going to be talking about and the overar overarching arc for your story, then it will definitely help with your creation of covers and titles. Jeannie said in my paranormal slash urban fantasy, the covers will all be spiraling clocks like the one in your avatar. Mm -hmm. My dark fantasy saga will have Phoenix in different stages of growth. Oh, ooh, that sounds lovely. I love it. Um, let's see. Maximize producing while minimizing your time investment. Yes. Maximize no, productivity while minimizing your time investment. That was the other quote that I uh, wrote that I thought was interesting. Like, how do you max, and he discussed it, but how do you maximize your productivity while not wasting your own time? I think this is something I've heard a couple of different um, writers talk about or heard, I've read in a couple of different writing books. I think most of them, ones that we, and I was trying to, I was going back and looking at all the books that we read, trying to figure out which one it was. I think it might've been one of Chris Fox's books. Um, right to market. Is that the one we read? Yes. Um, <clears throat> and I think he talks about this too, is that um, you have to decide how much your time is worth 
And is your time worth doing the little bits in between? And I think uh, Chris actually had, or um, Craig actually had a better, um, he explained it a little better um, because he said very like clearly, he was like, look, when you start out, you're not going to necessarily be able to afford someone who can run all of your marketing or someone who can do all of the business side. You're going to have to learn to do those. Yourself. Most people, when they start out, they have to do those things themselves. And so being realistic about um, how much time you have versus how much money. Mm -hmm. And if you have more time than you have money, then you're going to do it yourself. If you have more money than you have time, then you are probably going to pay somebody else. Right. That makes so much sense. Um, it's like uh, myself right now, I definitely have more time than money and more is in quotes. <laughs> <laughs> but if we're comparing <coughs> hands, I guess, I guess the time one is, you know, there's more of it, whatever. So what do you think, Kara? How do you try to manage your time wasted versus your productivity? Um, I manage it by um, writing down everything on demand. Yeah, pretty much. Um, I usually have to track and see where my time is actually going and where I'm spending a lot of it at. And that awareness actually helps me, um, helps me a lot. It also helps me set with my priorities and everything else. Um, and it's kind of also like an indicator to what my mental state is. So like on the days where I don't fill the log out, it's because that day is completely crazy or something's going on. Uh, and that, that, and that's always my first warning sign. Like, you know, yesterday I didn't track my time very well because I was kind of coping with some stuff that was going on behind the scenes. Um, and you know, it's, but at the same time, I can also go back and reflect and look on this and see where was I the most productive at? So, um, and I track my words in here too. And he talks about tracking your word count as well. Um, and some people will do this excessively um, and some won't and some advocate against it. But I think it's really important to know where you do do your best writing. Um, in Rachel Aaron's book, 2K to 10K, she spent time trying to figure out where she was the most productive at. And she found out that that was on Tuesdays and Thursdays when she wasn't at home and in a coffee shop. And she would just knock out 10K in like five hours. Right. Well, let's not go too deep into that because that's next month's nice book. <laughs> okay. But I'm just I'm just using that as an example of kind of like, you know, you're tracking what you're tracking where you're productive at and you're tracking when you're the most productive. And that's really important. And this all comes kind of comes back to knowing you and what your limits are and what your strengths are. And sometimes when people start off thinking about being productive, what they accidentally do is they compare themselves to somebody else. Um, I had a conversation with one person. They're like, you're always getting shit done. You're always knocking out. And I can't keep up with that. And I was like, nobody told you that you have to do it the same way that I do. Never feel that because you see that somebody's doing something that you have to do it too. For some reason, StreamYard isn't um, updating the the um, comments. But over here, Stevia said, I do better writing in the margins because I only have two minutes in the car at pickup to get an idea out. So I circumvent my inner critic. Um, it ups the stakes, but less in duration. I like short thrills, lol. But I and but you're working within like your time constraints and what you can do. Um, I find myself that I certainly do a lot of like writing sprints, and within those writing sprints, I have a mental image of how much I want to get done during that time period. I also am trying to draft at least 1000 words a month or not a month, I'm sorry, a day, and then edit um, at least one chapter a day. And I'm trying to give myself Saturdays off though. This doesn't quite count. So I might not be doing a good job, but I'm trying. What do you do, Amber, to try to keep yourself, uh, you know, not wasting your time? I know you don't have a lot of time. You have a good time as well. Yeah, it's pretty much from 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. is is work and kid related. Because um, I, I leave work at 3.30 and then go get her and then run and usually run one errand uh, before getting home. But 
it's really weird because I have basically from the time I get home at five to eight p.m. and then we have to go walk uh, dogs because my, that's my daughter's job, and I don't like her walking around at night. Um, and then after that, I have from then to eleven. And if I can join a stream, I will. Um, I seem to be very productive with sprinting if there's actually a live stream going on. But if, if there's no accountability there, I tend to just say, well, I can do it later. Um, or not go as fast as I normally would. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just trying to keep yourself accountable. I, I usually will block off one or two days for writing related stuff like the videos and the editing and the blogging and stuff like that. Um, I'll usually do that Monday and Tuesdays. And then like right now I'm editing instead of writing. Um, but I still keep track of that. And I try to keep as keep track as much as I can in, in calendars because on top of my writing and editing, I'm beta reading for others and, um, you know, doing other things. So, just trying to stay on topic on task. I find if I give myself an expectation by the end of the week, I will strive to reach it. And that seems to help me um, giving myself deadlines. Um, but then yeah. there's also the anxiety of not getting mad if you don't. <laughs> yeah. Deadlines are important, at least for me, even though a lot of times I do hear them whooshing past me, I at least <laughs> try to create them and uh, make them a thing that I try to, you know, actually achieve. So on a weekly basis, I have weekly goals that I try to, um, that I try to uh, reach. And then at the end of the week, I look and see what I haven't reached and what I've achieved instead, because that works for me. Um, Morgan says, um, learning to manage, manage her time is her main goal for the year, which is excellent. I think that's an excellent goal. Wendy says, learning to shut off social media is my next lesson for this year good luck sometimes i i uh, disappear for a few days on social media but i just keep coming back um let's see what else da -da 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 -da. see like saturday is the only day me and my mom both have off so um that I make that my day off when wendy they definitely do not whistle they they probably uh flip me off as they wish past me actually <laughs> <laughs> They're probably very angry at me for ignoring them. <laughs> um, Sarah says, I have to find a way to really leave work at work. If I have a bad day at my day job, it's impossible for me to focus when I get home. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I absolutely understand that. Wow, this has been a great discussion. Are there anything that y'all wanted to hit on in particular that we haven't touched yet? I think for those of us who have just published this year and I, and I was already kind of looking into this, but if nothing else, he also touches on taxes in this book and like what you can deduct and what, like how to find more so how to find where to find the tax forms you need. Like with, like for myself, I'm only on Kindle or only on Amazon. So like, um, he talks about like if you pay people to do things and if, if they pay you um, like at least where to go to look for all that tax information. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And it's tax season. Let's not yeah. talk about it. Oh. I thought that was important just because it is tax season. Like we picked the right time of the year to work. So read yeah. it. It's definitely important. Oh, but I'm not ready to think about it. Oh, yeah. My stomach. Great. My first W two just arrived yesterday, and I'm like, oh, oh it's officially begun. But it's it it uh, he does have some helpful information about mm -hmm. the business side of things, especially if you haven't actually uh, started to consider whether or not you're going to create a business and what type of business, and uh, some pros and cons for each. So, like he's not. Uh, Granted, he does have a lawyer background, but I don't know what kind of lawyer he is. And I don't feel like he's necessarily giving like official advice in that respect. It's just no, more of like just a you basic options. learner. Yeah. No. yeah even, he's, even he says, it, so I'm not giving you legal advice here. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think that that's an important um, reminder is 
when you have questions about something like taxes or legal things, go consult a professional. Um, that's no so doubt. essential in that while a book like this can point you in the right direction, um, you you have to you have to talk to a professional. Mm -hmm. um, those are such complicated issues. And because, especially if you live in the US, every state can be completely different. Mm -hmm. Your city, your, your municipality might be different again. And so take some time. This is one of those things that might cost you a little bit, but it's worth it to pay it up front to get the information you need rather than like waiting until you owe hundreds of thousands of dollars and you haven't paid it. And Ooh. that's way yeah. more expensive. So go talk to a lawyer, go talk to a tax professional. Um, they are out there. Um, well, that's why I thought it was so important because a lot of movies, when you first publish your book, you don't think about what rules, like you only have to make $10 for, for Amazon uh, royalties to, to have to say something about it on your taxes. So I don't think we always think about that, even on the business side. But so it's important. Yeah. Mr. Brown creeping in on my, my live stream there. <laughs> <laughs> I hate that the, um, the stream yard hasn't updated it. Like what the heck? So yeah. Um, one thing that I, cause you asked what I liked about it. I liked his constant reference to spreadsheets. <laughs> I knew you would. <laughs> I did. Ooh, am I shocked? <laughs> <laughs> I keep, I keep four. You probably have what? 400? <laughs> no. Well, I mean, I have one to track my expenses. I have the one for character names and locations. So that way I don't get them mixed up. And then, um, I have the other, uh, 398 belong to work. Um, just because that, that is a business and it's really complicated and I have to yeah. have everything in a separate thing for when we go to our tax person, because when it comes to taxes, the IRS is a very unforgiving God. So the more information oh, that I so can give, yeah, the more information I can give to our representative to help us file the taxes, the better, because what happens is, um, if the IRS suspects that you're shady. Um, they're not just going to look into your last year taxes. They're going to dig into your last 10 years of taxes and then they're going to squeeze every penny out of you. So the more, evi mm -hmm. the more evidence that you can have to support why you should be doing things the way that you are and claiming back the money that is owed to you, the better. And in fact, if you think that you're actually going to um, really kick off with a series, my, my honest recommendation coming just from me as a person to you guys is to go get an actual tax person. Don't do TurboTax. Don't go to h and mm -hmm. Block. Just because one of the things that you can do with an independent person is you can sign a power of attorney. So when the IRS does decide to come and audit you, you don't have to deal with all those messages coming in and having to send them back. They do it for you. All right. So is there anything else that you guys want to cover before we wrap up here? Because we're getting close to the top of the hour. Mm -hmm. Well, fantastic. I am so glad that we had this conversation. I, I feel like it was extremely helpful. And we have, we're going to try to decide the next book a little bit earlier than we did, you know, last year. It was the first time around. So, you know, we have room to grow. So, for February, we're going to be reading Rachel Aaron's 2002. 10,000 writing faster, writing better, and writing more of what you love. Um, if you could see, I purchased this item on August 27th, 2018. So, <laughs> like I said, I buy a lot of books about the craft and the and the uh, writing genre in general. And thank goodness that we're doing this because that means I'm maybe going to read like 12 craft books this year. Ooh. Yay! So links for everything are in the description, including links for the books that we read last time around. And I would like for y'all to go ahead and tell a little about yourself. Give us your outro so we can end the shindig and let everybody go. Okay. Um, Amber, we'll start with you and then go to Kara and then CJ. All right. Um, for me, um, of course, Unknown Love is available on Kindle and paperback and ebook form. Um, 
I'm working on the Audible version of that. Uh, that should be available in June, so look forward to that. Um, I post videos every Wednesday and live stream every Sunday. Um, I was going to interview Alec for his book today, but we're going to move that to next weekend um, due to health issues. Um, and Unknown Family should be out July or August, so if you want a beta read for that, let me know. Uh, so again, my name is Kara Brown. I am an urban fantasy author and a writer for other, or the operations director for Other World Inc. I write there too. I do lots of things. Um, uh, I don't have the pre-order for my book being relaunched just yet. We're waiting for the final uh, cover to come out and be polished. So they're doing that behind the scenes. If you want to throw me some coffee money, though, I do have a short story under my other pen name, which is Faye Black. That is 99 cents. That's being released on February 14th. Um, that that has to do a little bit more with the, the romance genre that I write under. So, you know, you can go find that and check it out and see if that's your jam. So. And I'm CJ Bloyer and I have uh, a free serial. It's YA fantasy fiction um, called the South Carolina Chronicles. Um, you can catch it over on WordPress. Um, New episodes are coming out the first week in February. So go read the first, I think there's 23 out there right now, and there will be more coming. And my name is Tamara Woods, and I'm a cozy mystery author. Thank you so much for being here, whether you're here with us now or you're watching the replay. If you are interested in the things that I do, if you want to help support me, I have a Patreon, and I would love for you to join my cozy community. I just released a couple uh, Patreon exclusive information uh, this week. I try to post something just for Patreon, at least one thing a week, and then trying to um, give access to all the other stuff we do, like this and uh, the Author Tube News podcast, um, my live streams that happen every Thursday at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern. Oh gosh, the hashtag Write Stuff group. Um, the, the author chief discord. I mean, there, I have a lot going on. And if you enjoy my content, and you enjoy the things I do, help support me. Because once I have 50 people who are on my Patreon, I want to create paperbacks for my books. But that is not free. So I really appreciate your support. Again, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you. We'll, like I said, the links are in the description for this month's book and next month's book. And all of our links and we'll see you in the next one. Bye everyone. Bye. <laughs> do, 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 do.